Okay. Well, if everybody will turn off their video and uh, mute their uh, their microphones, I'll uh, turn it over to Evelyn if, if you're ready. Oh, as ready as I'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I was going to say, Ira, you may have to help me uh, um, make sure everybody's got the, everything turned off. All right. It, well, looks, it looks like they all do. Okay. All right, then uh, I, I will turn it over to Evelyn. Uh, uh, I guess I'll let you introduce your, your <laughs> talk and yourself and uh, I'll let you have it. And you can start sharing your screen. Okay. All right, well. Uh, introducing myself. Hopefully everybody read what was in the <laughs> brochure, <laughs> so I don't have to go into all that gory detail, but uh, um, just a bit that, uh, as I told um, Richard earlier today, I'm an elder, an elder in the rock art world, so, um, but I want to give a little history of the, um, how this particular talk has evolved, but uh, first, it's to say welcome, and you can probably hear my cat in the background. <laughs> um, and uh, I want you to be prepared for this whirlwind journey because I have a whole lot of pictures. And um, to say that some of the journeys are documented in stone, such as by the Hopi here at Mesa Verde, um, Mesa Verde's National Parks, Petroglyph Point. And uh, I'll get to that later in the talk, but just to give an um, indication of where I'm at, for those of you who haven't been there, if you went to the Pecos Conference, you were really nearby recently in early August. Um, and most of you, I hope, know where the Colorado Plateau is, right there on the four corners. And of course, you guys are right down here, and Blagstaff's right here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but um, for those that might not know, it's sort of this area between Las Vegas and Salt Lake and Denver and Santa Fe. Um, we're going to be talking about places here, but I said the greater area because there'll be um, many other places in the Southwest and also, of course, um, around the world. But we're lucky here because we have had uh, it's been home to so many concentrations of petroglyphs and pictographs and cultures over millennia. And so as docents with the, or research associates with the Department of Anthropology at the Museum of Northern Arizona, um, in 2018, we shot this bird's eye view on the lower left um, with the, Bob did with the our drone um, of the, historic building and of course the sacred San Francisco peaks are on the horizon. And um, I do like to, when I give talks, acknowledge that we're on the traditional homelands of several different um, indigenous groups and, and respect the, their um, history that we're hoping to learn more about and share. Um, and in, in February of 2005, we were asked to help curate um, an exhibit that was supposed to open in June. So it was a very short time frame, And the exhibit um, was briefly described as that quote that you see on the screen. I'm not going to be reading everything, nor um, am I going to be showing every individual icon. So you guys get to find your own petroglyph sometimes <laughs> in, in some of these pictures. Um, but uh, anyway, um, that rock art around the world um, map was the start, the first image in the, in the exhibit. And it was sort of designed to give people a broader perspective on um, what the imagery is. So this is gonna be a very visual presentation, not so much um, research data. And many of the things you'll see were part of the exhibit. 
And um, hopefully I'll give credit to the people where credit is due, such as to Peter Phyllis, because he um, shared this uh, story about this particular panel. Um, and so I'm gonna be reading some of this from that particular exhibit. Um, 16 years after the Great Pueblo Revolt of 1680, the Pueblos of the Upper Rio Grande, or Rio Grande, depending upon how you to say it, raised another um, unsuccessful rebellion against the Spanish rule. Many of the families from Jimenez, Santa Clara, San Alfonso, and Cochi, Cochiti left their Pueblos to avoid Spanish retaliation and took refuge with their Navajo neighbors to the north. In the canyons along the San Juan River, this affected and this affected the Eastern Navajo community through intermarriage and cultural exchange. The rock art of the following 50 years reflects merging of the two cultures. This exceptional panel illustrates the similarity of Navajo rock art of this time with, um, oops the kiva and altar paintings of the Pueblos. The central figure, which shows a corn plant rising from a tablita. It represents the towering cumulus clouds. And of course, these are known for producing the sun and thunderstorms, so important to agriculture. The anthropomorph is the Navajo deity, Ganeskiti, who is guardian of the game animals associated with water and fertility. The curved horns of his head represent supernatural power to the Navajo, but they also suggest a relationship between the Neskidi and Pangu, the mountain sheep katsina of the Pueblos. The Neskidi holds a plant and a stick while his backpack framed in rainbow lines holds germinating seeds, symbolic of all life forms, being nurtured by the moisture that comes from the rainbow. The hourglass forms are symbolic for another Navajo deity, about, and I'm not going to pronounce these. I apologize to my Navajo and Hopi friends, but I'm going to mutilate your <laughs> language, I'm afraid. Uh, Tobat Sistin, maybe? Born of water, one of the warrior twins. And of course, jumping from New Mexico to California, out of the Colorado Plateau, but um, it, this, that's where these cup and ring glyphs uh, are. And then that's a pattern that we see around the world. And um, of course you see zigzags here and also the, the grooves, especially in the British Isles and Ireland, um, the, the most common petroglyph design there. And there's been lots of publications. And I believe early on, there was over a hundred hypothesized meaning and uses but no direct stories, of course, like we had just recently shared with about Gineskidi. Um, another very common design are spirals. Jerry Snow's Colorado Plateau image of a sun dagger at the center cupule of this spiral was taken on May the 27th. And it's not known whether this marks a significant time in the lives of the ancestral Puebloan people who live nearby and may probably made these stories. Um, however, May 27th could be important as a date after which corn could be planted in this area with little risk of frost. And another Colorado Plateau site, um, in the Verde Valley with both spirals, zigzags, and there's also some footprints in here, sandal print, a rectilinear spiral. And, um, but uh, thank you, by the way, to the Agave chapter for helping with the graffiti removal. We, um, I wanted to show this to show that you're not alone at Five Mile. Um, I, we don't know who did it or what they did it with, but thank goodness, the. Um, Coconino National Forest people were able to clean it off and um, it, without much damage, um, if any. The, um, ah, here we are to our but Mesa Verde um, symbol that was, um, we really do have some information and stories on stone. 
um, its information is in the petroglyph trail guide. So if you go up to the park, you, you too can get the guide and have your own copy. The drawing is um, a copy from uh, the elements of the uh, map that was interpreted by four Hopi men from Northeastern Arizona in 1942. The letter A is uh, Sipapu, the place of emergence in the Grand Canyon. B is the Eagle Clan separated from others um, and where they settled near the point of origin. C is the Mountain Sheep Clan depicted where they separated somewhere near Shiprock, New Mexico. So you see we're on this migratory journey of the, the Hopi in this um, imagery. D is the Parrot Clan. They took up residence somewhere near Mountain Sheep Clan. Um, e has two interpretations, which I find interesting because a lot of places, if you talk to different people, even with the same group, you'll get two answers. This one said the uh, horn tone clan split from the migrating um, Pueblos, or it um, could be the lizard spirit whose influence let the remaining people into um, a period of wandering. Then F is the whipping Pachina who straightened out and quotes the people and gave direction to their travels. G has two interpretations of them. That spiral there is either the actual end of the migration at Mesa Verde or the prophesized end of the migration at modern Hopi villages. Then H also has two interpretations. It's either the mountain lion clan symbol um, or the all powerful spirit animal watching over the people in their travels. And finally, that little separate area, the um, I, whipping Kachina, is influencing the people that are marked by the J. The guide goes on to say that these meanings may or may not be what the original maker had in mind. And of course, if you look up at where this is up on the panel, there's lots of other designs here. Um, so there's certainly more things going on, more handprints. Um, and this was mentioned as possibly a Kachina mask. Um, while not a story on stone, the Sarara people in central India depict a people spiral and um, sort of like a ceremony or a dance perhaps, because you see the musician in the middle with the horn. Um, and there's many other activities going on here. You'll see dwellings and plants and birds and musicians and the utensils of daily life. And if you've read what it says there, it's obviously important and um, probably deals with fertility of crops, requests for general well-being and um, or wealth. And while not as complex, but full of meaning for the creator, the, in the wall design, notice the flute player right in the middle, the acrobats on the left side, and also a team playing with a ball game, the archer up on top and the plants. And so, yes, of course, not only flute players, but in um, other musical instruments are found around the world. And um, note here those unusually shaped legs um, because this may indicate um, that the didgeridoo player was uh, a shaman going into a transformation while in an altered state of consciousness as that's been um, mentioned in literature as one of the effects. Near Santa Fe, New Mexico, we find this line of Pebloan flute players. We also see anthros and footprints and snakes. Notice the one with horns. Um, behind me, uh, as I talk, you see there's also another horned serpent that's on private property and not very far from this particular site. Um, and now, of course, there's even a little spiral there and much more. 
Of course, there's no rhinoceros depicted on the Colorado Plateau, um, but um, here in France, there's painted rhinos and hippos, horses, lions, cave bears, and owls, but no depictions of snakes that we're aware of. This panel does not have a painted bear, but the scratches of their claws on the wall is evidence of their presence. Here, you can see those right there, the cave bear scratches. Um, we were fortunate in the year 2000 to have been the fifth and sixth Americans ever invited to visit this amazing Chauvet cave and assist in photography of a narrow passage with many concavities and curves that required um, uh, careful stitching of panoramas and enhancements, uh, which brought out some of the minor details that had not yet been documented, such as this red line right here on the right-hand side lower, which is they are interpreting as a, another lion, the back of a red one painted in red between the two black ones. Um, and, but what we all think of uh, from Chauvet, I think is uh, the wonderful horses and bears, the incredible, beautiful, um, paintings, oh, lions over here, the red dots of geometric forms. Um, also um, over here, of course, the owl made of, uh, from clay by scraping it away. And that mud glyph is uh, actually um, a unique depiction of an owl in uh, Paleolithic France. Um, other Paleolithic caves have abstract finger line impressions but um, not uh, owls. The, um, and while I haven't shown them, there are, in addition to geometric signs, as they call them, uh, painted handprints throughout the cave, and we'll get to handprints um, later. And the famous picture. I can't sh give a show without looking at these incredible, expressive, beautiful horses that almost seem alive. And, of course, pictures don't do it justice. When you're there, they're just, I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, what is their story? Well, that's lost in time, but um, appreciated, of course. Uh, and Chavez um, paintings led me to consider um, images that other cultures place um, throughout time and how they have depicted similar things such as the horses shown here. Um, of historic scenes, those of you who may have seen my, I'm, um, the presentation I gave to your chapter on Canyon de Chez may recognize some of these images that were probably in that um, presentation. Um, the lower image um, shows some of the variety of the way the Navajos depict um, horses, showing the intricate color patterns, saddle blankets, tackle, reins, um, people with different clothing and hats, just um, very detailed and very um, descriptive, but without an actual story that, of which I'm aware, but I bet it, we, we could probably find people who might know. Um, I wish I had the story associated with these petroglyphs. I just love the face-to-face uh, -face off uh, between the horse and the horned serpent. Here's his horn right here. Um, perhaps some of you, if any of you know any of these stories, uh, be sure to let me know. Uh, the armored horses, were um, actually also depicted in uh, uh, areas north of the Colorado Plateau. We've heard talks by John and Mavis Greer on that subject. I didn't have any uh, pictures to show here. The India images are small, um, intricate red paintings on the ceiling of a shelter in a national park near Bhopal. Um, they're said to date from the medieval period, but the um, 
Scottish, well, Bob and I were, were looking online and uh, the medieval period is identified in various dates. Um, so we're not sure of an actual date. The Scottish Pictish, stone, Pictish stones um, are dated within most of the first millennium of the AD. And I find it interesting how different from very um, good perspective and accurate sizes to have this uh, large rider on top of a relatively small horse. Um, from horses to owls. Well, many of the painted owls are depicted with each eye a different color or a different shape. Uh, and I won't say for sure that that unusual petroglyph down here is really a, um, may or may not be an owl. These two examples also have slightly different eyes. The Wind River one has unusual wings that appear to be feet. Um, and perhaps it's also associated with transformation and shamanism. I say this in part because the, uh, this is a Shoshone vision quest site uh, known from ethnography and also uh, very important to them when our um, Aurora field trip went there, they came and actually um, uh, smudged us with um, smoke and, and wished us uh, well and safety because they considered it a dangerous spot to go to. And we've had that experience in other places around the world of different beliefs of, of different groups. At least here, these owls have wings. Another interesting panel that has owls and bear imagery, among other designs. Um, the, there's one of the owls, another. One of the bears, and sometimes the, when a bear is depicted vertically, it's um, associated with the Ute uh, bear dance. The, um, there's also a very large and powerful bear paw. And bear paw glyphs and bears in general are very common throughout, a world, throughout the world, in part, I think, to um, astronomy and, and the Big Dipper, as we call it, being depicted as Ursa, a major great bear by several different cultures. But back to Chauvet, this is one of my favorite Chauvet images. I love its uh, masterful simplicity and its placement on the ceiling of the inside of a small alcove. That's actually very difficult to access because you don't want to impact any of the Paleolithic floor. The French have set up a track and then you get on this little path and you can, uh, and they push you in under <laughs> the overhang, so you can look up at this particular image. It's really um, beautiful to me. Uh, and uh, I wish I knew more stories about these. They're definitely in need of interpretation by the de descendant communities, um, as I suspect that both of these have multiple levels of meaning. And I think if you read Polly Shaftsma's um, uh, some of her books, you'll, you'll get some of the meanings. I didn't have time to review that today, um, but this wonderful outline bear with the three stars in the middle, which normally we think in astronomy here, three stars of the uh, belt of Orion, but here it's in the middle of the bear, but uh, perhaps one was placed, they were placed independently of each other and, and could have two different meanings, but I truly don't know. There is one horned serpent head and also one horned um, masks, two horned masks, another one horned serpent, um, probably Kachinas, maybe Masao with the teeth is uh, sometimes shown that way. And the atlatl hunting scene is um, also um, interesting because a lot of the, each and every animal I think, 
if I'm right, has an atlatl. And there's also several different um, human forms. And perhaps this fellow is some sort of uh, leader or keeper with his staff, um, because we've seen that in, and heard about presentations of the power of, of this at places like the um, San Diego Rock Art Research Association. The, um, early on, John was talking about the Arctic Circle and Alza Norway. This is the most north rock art site uh, known and the um, um, very few bears, but there are bears um, depicted. And they're also well known in the Sami culture. They're considered a sacred animal um, with magic, religious and ceremonial uses. Some of the earliest rock art in Alta um, and the bear cult could be as much as 8,000 years old. Part of this motif shows tracks leading to a symbol that may represent the bear's den and the tracks go all around it. In the 18th century, the Sami um, walked around actual bear dens so that they'd leave their footprints um, just like they're shown in the rock art. And the question, uh, person that was writing the article about this asked was, well, did the killing of a powerful animal make the hunter a powerful person? Um, so much we know and so much we don't know. Um, some researchers say that this local to our part of the world, um, petroglyph is a bear. Others have called it a saber-toothed tiger. Um, we think it's a bear due to its short tail and that close observation indicates the two lines out of the mouth were added later than the rest of the image. But at least it's a good segue to real lions. And um, of course the African lions, not, not necessarily, not the same, not, not at all with uh, our, our current lion, but the, um, Notice its long tail and how it ends with this tuft and uh, shaped like a paw print. This um, tail convention is seen on other lion depictions and possibly on mythological beasts too. I say that because of a site, now here we're in Namibia, which is very close in the far south to South Africa. And now we're gonna head up to Egypt and the Western Desert. So very far away, but very or similar imagery. See the tuft on the tail that looks like a paw. But um, I tell you, this is a very amazing site and that's just a very small portion of a very large area. The intricate superpositions, the variety of style, size and color indicate that this was a very sacred spot. Um, visited by different peoples over a long time span. It's one small part uh, of, the, of the shelter, as I mentioned, which has many handprints. Um, note the tail of yellow paint grid lines within the beast. Let me see it here, because you'll see a similar grid type lines um, further on in this talk. The, um, uh, also, of these, this type of body posture is um, seen other places. And of course, the giraffes, but um, the big yellow figure looks, um, a, a squatting figure with, with a, one arm up and one arm down. We're gonna see postures later on too. But um, I can't, I, every time I look at um, scenes like this, I see more like, all oh, these little tiny figures here, stick figures, just truly an amazing site. It was a very pleasure to get to visit that site. The um, greater Southwest is not to be outdone though. I mean, cloud terraces on a long red tongue, or maybe that's not a tongue. Maybe it's like um, speech breath, which uh, has been in written about lately, or, Oh, well, notice the claws um, in red. And of course, there's that red tail. Um, 
Then the, the Kiva mural, look at that claw. Oh, I wouldn't want to be anywhere near that. That looks like a feather headdress and also uh, a pouch with arrows. Um, I think Polly also talks about this being a, a warrior um, or having associations with that. And so lions, you know, have been powerful and dangerous prey throughout time. Um, and of course, they, they also here in Shaw Bay, just like those horses, have this incredible depth of, of uh, perspective. And they're not all lions. The closer you look, you say, oh, that up there looks like ears of a bear. And of course, here's a rhinoceros. And um, what else could we find? Uh, oh, I don't know. It's just a bubble form. We're going to be talking about those later. Um, Handprints, yes, there were some in Chauvet. There's many, many, many in Canyon de Chez, or in these in particular in Canyon del Muerto. Um, the mud prints, um, which are positive, the stylized ones, the um, gosh, blues and reds and yellows and um, greens and just amazing um, variety of depictions and also, of course, stencil patterns. Um, and there, not only Colorado Plateau, but also um, Egypt. Uh, and I'm thanks to Kelly Hayes Gilpin and the artist working at Chabay, who um, uh, what the drawing is from, uh, showing the technique of application. Um, at least one of them. Well, uh, there's others that have, uh, and I think there's even been artifacts that have shown little tubes, hollow tubes where they could have been blown through. And I think, and maybe Bob can tell me if I'm wrong, that those hands from Egypt are from the Cave of the Beast, but we did see many other uh, painted shelters, so I won't absolutely swear to that. Um, and stencils are not confined to hands, as you can see from this uh, Carnarvon Gorge site with an arm and foot. And um, of course, these boomerangs. And oh, here's a spiral looking. Um, and uh, Graham Walsh, who was a park ranger there and a friend, um, also mentioned that some of the ways these hands are positioned and the way they also show their fingers are um, meant to be um, messages, uh, sign language, and you know, or communication that the Aboriginals used. Um, and note the placement of these Chinese figures um, or it's early, we don't know exactly which group um, early on in the history or the dating of it. Bob, unless Bob can chime in if he knows, um, this was an area right along a river and it's a very large site, about 100 meters long as I recall. And you couldn't see it well up close. Your better overall view was from a boat on the, on the river. But notice how the, um, the hands are up, they're squatting, like I mentioned about the yellow figure in Africa. And some of them appear to be balanced on that landline that has the animal walking on it. Um, but the stories associated with it, we don't know. Um, nor this one from Hawaii, although I suspect that there are descendant populations who might have some clues about that. Um, I enjoy the way the uh, circles are connected to ones to a hand and ones to a foot. You certainly wonder what it all is. Now we invite you to come to Flagstaff, uh, one of our favorite places, the Picture Canyon Natural and Cultural Preserve, um, where we see these Northern Sanawa figures with that typical oval um, stomach, but some people said, oh, well, that's, those, are, those are lizards. Um, 
and notice the zigzag. Is that a zigzag or is this a, um, a head of a snake that's coming out or, or, or is this a head and it's attacking? There's so many things um, we don't know, but if we're around and you're in Flagstaff, give us a call and request a tour. Um, we love to show off this place. Um, now, then, this is also the question. Around the world, we don't know, are these headdresses? Are they depicting hair? Are they sun rays? Um, the ones in New Mexico, I'm pretty sure are feathers because you see how they have like the tips of the um, different colors and um, probably masks and probably were decorated um, that way. And um, there may be people who could identify with their particular masks or Kachina figures. Um, now back to our um, wonderful display at the Museum of Northern Arizona and some of Peter Pillis's um, ethnography that he shared. Uh, the most important supernatural being in Yavapai oral traditions is Skahata Kamshe. According to Yavapai tradition, Skahata Kamshe and his grandmother were the first rattlesnake shamans. A zigzag design or triangular elements along the torso recall the markings of rattlesnakes or lightning. The Red Rock Canyon near Sedona, Arizona is the most significant cultural landscape to the Yavapai people, as it contains the places where many events in their oral traditions took place. Most of these revolve around Skadahara Kamshke. <laughs> I apologize to you Yavapai, I don't pronounce it right. Um, a supernatural cultural hero who killed monsters, created humans, and taught them the skills and ceremonies needed to exist. And he can be recognized in the rock art by his eagle feather headdress. And you can see on the left with the white and the um, feathers with the black tips. And um, his associations with the zigzags and the diamond shaped elements. His image is generally larger than other elements as befits his importance. With a height of 90 centimeters, the one on the right is the largest known image of Skahara Kamshe. A dominant focus of this pictograph is a zigzag line that encircles him and emerges through his hands and elbows. This likely indicates lightning, a powerful force that's intimately associated with Skahara Kamshe, and which may relate this pictograph to several stories about him. In one story, he visits his two fathers, the cloud and the sun, who set him through a series of tests and ordeals. After successfully passing these challenges, he returns to earth by holding on to two lightning bolts created for him by cloud and sun. And from knowledgeable interpretations to the unknown, at least to me, um, the Hopi or Apache or other descendants may know. Um, the site on the right is um, thought to be archaic with its prominent um, geometric designs. Um, the one on the left, I think, is up at Hopi, actually. Um, but now I don't remember. Now, I think we, we were told about the importance of the, these triangular designs, but not necessarily told the, the meanings. Um, here, I wonder if this oval symbol, um, could it be symbolizing fertility? Um, our local female guide in Papua New Guinea, who directed us to the site, said it was a woman's menstrual site. The male guide interpreted them as two halves of an open local large nut. So once again, we have multiple interpretations, but interesting visual representations. Now, Lily, the waterman elder at the woman's site, shared stories of that large dreamtime figure 
um, who most aboriginals believe placed their images on the rocks and shared their stories with initiated members uh, of the tribes and the traditional land stewards. Um, and they who were only supposed to share them on, um, in some cases with um, only initiated people. So a lot of the stories as the younger folks do not want to be um, necessarily initiated, the stories are dying with some of the elders. Um, not necessarily with this tribe, I was actually referring more off to the West, which I don't have pictures of the, um, actually that particular group of people asked us not to share those pictures. And so we, um, I did not include them. Um, some of the Mount Borodil um, pictures, as you see on the upper left, uh, those designs have been interpreted by the keepers of the site. Uh, note the fine line details of the eyelashes and those sort of strings running down or across your chest. Those are actually, they said, part of string games that um, were played um, and were more than just games. There was um, a lot of levels of knowledge there. A whole thesis was written about it, or maybe it was a dissertation. Anyway, um, still incredible, um, interesting uh, traditional knowledge carried along in an oral manner. And Bill Harney, the Waterman elder, is adding eyes to the figure. Um, and uh, keepers of the knowledge do refresh the images as necessary. And they bemoan the fact when, um, uh, that some of them are not being kept up because the knowledge has gone. This large rectangular geometric design may depict loom woven cotton blankets. Some designs have been found tie dyed into cotton textiles. Um, and the dates for that, this is based on Kelly's information, 1200 to 1500 AD. I noticed um, Richard that that figure looked very much like the one behind you on your um, video earlier. And I don't have information about the Utah um, female. But this from Chauvet Cave is just a, uh, a personal story because when we were there in the year 2000, this um, phallic shaped stalagmite with a bison uh, in charcoal drawn on it um, was only seen as in the left um, image when it was viewed from the end of the narrow strip that had been placed in the path of the original cavers so that we wouldn't disturb or go off that path and touch you know, the surrounding Paleolithic surface. But Yannick um, had the idea to attach a small camera to a pole and um, have a way of tripping the um, uh, shutter so that he could take a picture and voila, the one on the right shows the <laughs> conflagration of the woman's torso shared with the bison's left front leg. And that is um, certainly um, unique in the, the cave art. Also note there's a, uh, I believe that's a lion back there. And I think there's a, another horse back there. So it was, um, we couldn't go everywhere and see everything. Um, you, you had to stay on that strict path and rightly so. Um, back on the Colorado Plateau, a large female figure is often associated with um, animals and fertility, and she's been named the mother of game animals. Um, each Pueblo village today has an important female spirit who is the mother of deer, antelopes, mountain sheep, and or rabbits. And I think that was information was also from the um, exhibit at the museum. Fine line details are present in many places of you've already seen, but um, 
this one up here is unusual. This is his eyelashes go all the way around his eyes, his or hers or its, because very rarely do you have three heads or heads coming out of your shoulders. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever seen that any other place. Um, and this Australia has these wonderful fish um, and just incredible detail. And they can even tell um, species they are so well depicted. In Namibia, again, um, Southern Africa, this, um, oh, lots of researchers like Harold Pogger or David Lewis Williams and others have mention rain animals. And um, this is probably depicting a rain giraffe. You see the rain flowing down over him. And the uh, three walking figures, of course, have body designs and either caps or hair done up. Um, but notice the back one. He has his entrails depicted, um, the one that has also carrying the bow. And I don't know what the others are carrying. And East Central Utah, there's a site that's been called Intestine Man, although others have seen it as a snake design. Um, and others um, say it's certainly shamanic. You have all these spirit helper figures um, around these, walking up this. Um, but I don't know that there's um, any ethnography in, because of uh, <laughs> this is um, archaic or earlier, isn't it, Bob? I don't know. Um, so it's just interpreting and not knowing, not having the real story. Other forms of um, body decoration, postures, hair or headdresses are seen in many different places. Um, in Papua New Guinea, the French archeologist um, who worked at this site, which is a burial site, um, mentioned that these red dots on the outside of this figure were depicting um, the disease from which the um, person died. And these unusual um, boar <laughs> pictures, I say unusual because look at the size of it compared to the little red human figure and who's running toward a crab. And Bob's um, image enhancement shows the crab here better. And this <laughs> little running figure being chased by this and apparently this was some story, something very known because um, uh, one of the books on India rock art that I have mentions that uh, an almost identical panel is uh, seen at a, another location, but no story was told to tell us what it was. The, um, uh, one of my favorite places, um, Rapa Nui, also known as Easter Island and um, the depiction on the right of an octopus. And I think that's the only one of which I'm aware, um, or at least that I've seen. And the bas-relief sculptures of the birdmen on the left. And um, when the Dutch arrived and they knew and heard the story of how the annual um, return of the turns was important to that island you see off the, um, coast to the left. And so the young men would um, wait until the time they saw the turns return and then they'd swim across to the island, gather a turn egg and had to swim back with it and climb up the cliff, which is quite steep here. Um, and the first one to do that successfully was the bird man and honored for the whole year and didn't have to do work and was you know, well taken care of. So. Um, here, um, the ethnography did, did have stories associated with the stone. And I just 
don't know if the artist of the National Geographic had been to the site in Mount Boredale over there on the left-hand side of that enormous serpent coming out from a crack in the uh, back and um, notice there's five of us down here. How large this, think of all the effort to go into creating the paint, to creating this, to making this um, image. And one thing about it, around the world, snakes are really important because they're liminal creatures. They can be um, in the water, uh, in the cracks in the rock, or up on the land. So um, they shed their skins to us like rebirth. There's all sorts of reasons why we have many depictions of incredibly large serpents and snakes and associated stories, but some of which are lost um, around the world. And here in Zimbabwe is another very long, and I wished I had actual numbers, but I remember it being at least 100 feet, but I don't know, I could be wrong. Uh, at my age, I, I forget a lot. I notice all these human figures standing on its back. Um, and of course, there's other animals. There's a big giraffe over here. But let's uh, take a closer look at its head and its enhanced image. I like it. the hair, the teeth, the ears, and of course, got a human standing on its nose. And then you wonder, well, which came first, the um, painting of the human, the painting of the snake, were they done at the same time? But since they have all those other figures on its back, you really wonder what the, what the story is. And here in Baja, we have another serpent with these red and black figures standing along its back. And also this one has, here's his head and his mouth. And this is an antler. And this is a, another antler. And this is an ear. And this is the other ear. So another horned, or in this case, antlered um, snake that's quite large. Um, this is just a close up of the front of him, um, not very far from the Colorado Plateau. Mm. And here's one we've never been to, uh, Paul Schoonover sent us these five photos and said it was so big he couldn't um, get it all in one image. And so it so reminded us of um, Australia and that big serpent. And notice this very long red line. Is that a long red tongue like we saw on the mountain lion? <laughs> um, these red beady eyes, there's red above its head of where its horns are. Um, uh, but no stories associated with it, at least that I know. Oh, I'm just now noticing this sign. Every time I look at these pictures, I see more. It's so much fun. Um, oh, yes, we have. Remember Skahada Kamshe and the diamond shapes and the... Um, rattlesnake design, although we don't see the rattles down here, but most likely teeth, horn. Um, and early on, I showed you the beast with the painted um, grid. Well, one of those things we see a lot in the early art is these um, diamond patterns and also rectilinear grids. One case from Texas down in the Pecos River area and the other um, from some other different sites in India. It not only has that grid, it also has other geometric forms. It's fairly hard to see, but um, here along the Little Colorado River area, the basket maker figure that's 
big, well-made feet and a patterned body, well-pecked indented head, individual long arms and hands, throwing perhaps this net, um, which makes us think perhaps of hunting and of nets. And the one in Canyon de Chez on the upper left was so weathered and worn, we didn't, couldn't see other elements around it. But the one on the right, um, those pattern body anthropomorphs have rabbit sticks or, or fending sticks as some people call them. Um, and of course this again, looks like perhaps a net. This member's bowl is great because it's got that diamond net design where there's no doubt about it being a net. Rabbits, the rabbit tracks and the hunters with their um, curved sticks. And I don't know what this fellow is. Looks like he's upside down, but perhaps he's waving his hands and trying to make sure that rabbits don't go that way out of the net and just go into the net. Um, and this is um, a, some very small um, images that are in a very small shelter in um, New Mexico. So they're hard to see in the real, but when you look at Margolis drawing, oh, huh. I set her name down here and I see it's not there. Um, that's Margaret Barrier's uh, work helped us with the publication we had um, about this site that we call the Hunter Shelter. And you see the hunters lined up, you see the dogs, the hunting dogs with them. The, um, a rabbit here, another rabbit, probably a dead rabbit being held. Uh, the rabbit sticks of the hunters and rectilinear patterns that um, are nets. There are two other panels in the hunter shelter, the buck prey and the um, one where it's after it's been killed, it's being rendered. And you have one figure holding this leg, another figure holding this one, another figure removing probably the heart another with some other part of the insides, this figure holding the a front leg. And you see they've all laid down their weapons. And some of these weapons were not for sure what they are, except that we also see them in archaic rock art in the Pecos um, River area. And this interesting, the, that same area also has these interesting um, hair designs. If you're interested in more details, you can discuss our, or send you a copy of our paper. We have lots of reprints of that. Um, back in India, you also have diamond shaped patterns uh, with these large antlered um, deer, they call them there. And then um, I think the two in front are, are cattle and they have different, um, at least this one has a different design, one without a design. And there's this, um, person holding this bow and something else. And so you wonder, these are normally wild animals, not domesticated. Um, what, what story went along with this? The, um, some of you may know these panels, the uh, lower one in Nine Mile Canyon is a very famous, um, well, um, documented sites then they even have a travel guide so, you know, that you can get uh, to, as you drive through. It's, I don't know why they call it nine miles because it's more like 40 mile drive. But um, it's interesting because they call this the hunt panel, but you really wonder because look how the tongue is touching the back. Uh, all of them are touching each other somehow. It's something more going on. This armless figure, only, well, I'll know there's a couple more bows and arrows. So there's, it could be a hunt, but I have a feeling that there's a lot more to this story. And up here, lots of animals, big antlers, 
some of the other designs we saw early on and all throughout this, but um, no weapons. There is though an enclosed cross. We've seen that several places. And it's also very common around the world. Um, this by the way is damage done by someone um, taking a mold of that particular lift and it, it left the residue. And that of course is not something that is done um, or should be done. And lots and lots of lines of figures holding hands, some with unusual um, headdresses, some in profile, um, older ones in white, and these with um, interesting hairstyles. This one, I'm pretty sure I showed you in the Canyon de Shea before because it's ceremonial cave and very, very famous. Oh, another stylized handprint. And here, that same Western desert cave of the beasts with the reflection. Is it reflection in water? Water is so important too. The, um, oh, <laughs> thank you, Bob. <laughs> Was I only half showing? Sorry. <laughs> you could have done it sooner. No. Ah, well, only a few more slides. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, and you can hear my cat too. Um, and I'm pretty sure I showed this one too with these basket maker images with these airmen and the bird headed figures that we think are, except for those bird men at Rapa Nui are um, uh, sort of unique to the Colorado Plateau. And this shows the location of some of those airmen and how steep and difficult it is to get to some of these places where these incredible figures are done. And these were interesting because um, Larry Lohendorf, who is a principal investigator here on our three-year work, um, was able to date the organic material in the mud over the ear figures. So we know definitely that they're in basket maker range as predicted. And here you can see the mud and we were lucky that that had organic material in it. Um, and these unusual designs that we don't know if it's um, something to do with hearing or uh, with initiations or what. This other figure up on the San Juan, you see that these in quote headdresses or ear extensions are not just with the anthropomorphs, but are out by themselves. Um, and there's also some other extensions which are different. But although this looks like it could be the same as that, is that maybe this is just the head of this. That's a very complex panel that has been very carefully documented by a lot of the uh, dedicated people at the up in the Utah Rock Art Research Association. And Fremont figures up in, again, Utah, near Vernal. And uh, it's on a ranch, but it is um, open. You may go visit this. And these are very high on the cliff face and amazingly prepared with a bas relief. And notice this, it's sort of like the mother of game, but not, I don't certainly know vulva form, but we don't know um, the, Feet look like they're cut, and that could be that sometimes mm, done later on when somebody's trying to take the power out of a out of a picture. You see that on the San Juan River. But back to our spirals and our concentric circles. Here they are underneath. A lot of times, these later people placed their images over or where or near where the footprints of the ancestors were, or footprints in quotes, um, because it had to do with um, what, their, um, uh, what they left, the messages they left on stone, even though we don't know these stories in particular. They certainly worked hard to abrade the 
surface first and then peck it and then paint it. And um, is this a shield? Um, look at the beautiful necklace and body designs, just, oh, and how the legs are shaped too, knees and calves, and feet, just, I don't know, some of the um, best that I hope you have a chance to see someday. And finally back to the, our very own painted desert here in Arizona. And you can see again, the spirals, the hands, the people, the snakes, the stars perhaps. And um, I hope you've enjoyed your migration with me, uh, comparing the Colorado Plateau with the rest of the world. Thank you for watching. Well, thank you, Evelyn. Uh, I just absolutely loved all of your uh, pictures. And we seem to be so blessed to have so much rock art here in our local area. Yes, I agree. Thank you, Evelyn. That was really beautiful. Really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Are there any questions? <laughs> I have more questions than we have time for. <laughs> Go back to the first one. <laughs> uh, Evelyn, one, what, one question. You, you referred to those uh, Barrier Canyon, I think, era people holding rabbit sticks, you called them. They look yes. like scythes. Or, or something. They, those were like sort of looked like boomerangs that they throw at the rabbits. Yes, um, there's actually, I have a whole talk on that hunter shelter um, because we wrote that paper on it. And, and uh, I have the pictures of those artifacts. They're definitely found um, at different sites. Um, oh, I can't think of his name and Bob's just already left. So I can't ask him. Um, uh, gosh, he was one of the research associates at the museum, but at, at any rate, he's wrote a dissertation out of uh, NAU, and he said he thinks they were, um, they may have been used for hunting rabbits, but they were also, and probably more importantly, used as fending sticks, uh, especially early on, you know, like with, um, if you had an atlatl dart coming at you and you want to fend your, defend yourself, um, that would be, um, something you could use. Okay, um, one other question then. The, um, along the San Juan River, they had those um, coming out of their ears and straight up out of their heads. Um, yes. Like a series of discs or such. Um, your interpretation for those? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you'd listened to Carol Patterson, she would have given you interpretations. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, I, I, there may be some, however, I did. Um, oh, gosh, now I can't remember who I was sorry. I was at that site with Polly Chasma and um, um, she didn't have any interpretation. And I can't recall who was there with the Hopi, and whether it was Kelly, somebody from the museum, or whether it was somebody up in Utah. But at any rate, they said the Hopi were, uh, were talking among themselves in Hopi, but that they indicated that they really didn't um, know. Uh, it, it was a, a disconnect with any of the, at least the group that was there. Now, Hopi society is very complex. There's, as you, you saw, there's different clans and there's also, also different um, societies. So that could be, as I mentioned about Australia, that some of these societies um, are no longer um, with us. And so the oral history is gone um, or it's something that cannot be shared. And um, uh, as I mentioned with uh, Australia, and there's been also places, I, in fact, maybe even tonight, I was trying really hard 
to only show either national parks or places that were open. And I didn't mention though, there's one or two of these sites were on the Navajo Nation. And we have worked there under a permit. And um, also the all of the images that were in that um, uh, exhibit, we got permission from the parks to show and from the tribes to show. Um, and in fact, they even helped us with some of the language of how things were used. So I wish that more people were careful like that. And, um, um, you know, I think we learned so much more by talking to the descendants. Um, but in this case, um, I don't know. And one time when I did show that picture and I was asking if anybody knew of other locations because right now we only have them up on the San Juan River in Canyon de Chez and at one site in between. Uh, and I've now seen two or three sites more, but they've all been in that general area, whether um, they've been seen anyplace else. And one lady in the uh, audience suggested that it might have something to do with um, hearing and communicating with the spirits. But again, that was, she was a native person, but she was, um, uh, it wasn't necessarily, she wasn't claiming it was her culture. She was just giving that as a possibility. And when I've been out on the, um, like the Colorado River with uh, some of the native people, they would, um, one of them even said, well, we know that these change over time. We bring our own interpretations with it, even though we've heard stories about it. So, and they thought it was meant to be um, that it, uh, the changing, that they were placed in those places of importance, but that we certainly could have our own views about them, so. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you, I'm gonna have to go back and rewatch this. You had so much to show and uh, <laughs> I was just blabbing away though I was like after that I thought oh my god this is being recorded oh I wanted to jump in so many times but you had so much to say I knew it <laughs> <laughs> well I didn't time it uh, I, I know I didn't make it thank goodness I did make it in under an hour but I was trying to go fairly fast I guess I should have slowed down in some places but um. <laughs> oh no you did great I'm glad you uh, told us everything that you did and <clears throat> so that was great. I was, I really enjoyed it. Um, does anyone else have anything to comment or, or uh, talk about? Any questions? Uh, one other question, uh, Evelyn, to, to contact you as we look at this again and again and again and try to... <laughs> absorb it all it's going to take a while but when we have a question should we use your contact info you showed there on the screen briefly well, will that well, work yeah uh, it would be actually that's the business uh, email and uh, my direct is really easy it's just e billow um, at aol.com so it's easy to remember e b i l l o at aol.com so Feel free to ask me questions there. Thank um, you. I can even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> put it in the. Uh, uh, well, I want to thank you again. You gave a, a very excellent uh, presentation, and at least this participant was very excited to see what you had to say. And uh, if nobody has anything else, I'll say thank you again, and we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Evelyn. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs>